Hello, I'm Professor Larissa Berent from the University of Technology, Sydney, and it's my great pleasure to be hosting this afternoon a conversation with Kate Grenville on her new book, A Room Made of Leaves. Um, I just also wanted to add, I know we've just had an acknowledgement of country, but I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which has a special resonance in relation to what Kate and I will be talking about today. And I just wanted to pay respects to elders past and present on this country. Let me give you a brief outline of uh, Kate Grenville's uh Kate, Kate Grenville's CV. It's really impressive and I don't want to waste too much time with it because I'm sure a lot of people will be really familiar with her body of work, but it is worth noting that Kate Grenville is one of Australia's most celebrated writers. Her international bestseller, The Secret River, was awarded local and overseas prizes, has been adapted for the stage and as an acclaimed television miniseries and is now a much-loved classic. Kate's other novels include Sarah Thornhill, The Lieutenant, Dark Places and the Orange Prize winner, The Idea of Perfection. Her most recent books are two works of non-fiction, One Life, My Mother's Story and The Case Against Fragrance. She's also written three books about the writing process. In 2017, Kate was awarded the Australia Council Award for Lifetime Achievement in Literature. And on a personal note, I'd like to say that Kate is an author of Insight and Generosity, which I think is why many of us are drawn to her work. And she's also a master storyteller. I love the way her stories ask us larger questions about who we are, what our values are and how we share this country. And as a younger novelist myself, she has been an enormous inspiration and a great mentor. Kate's latest book is A Room Made of Leaves and is a fictionalised account of the life of Elizabeth MacArthur. So, Kate, that's the introduction. It's so great to have you here to talk about it. It's wonderful to be talking to you, Louisa, and thank you for all those generous words. Thank you. Well, I just loved the book, so it feels like a real thrill to be able to have finished it and then to ask you all the questions I had while I was was going through it. Um, I guess the first question is, this this book is a fictionalised account of Elizabeth MacArthur's life. What drew you to her as the subject of a book? I think a lot of women are really fascinated by Elizabeth MacArthur because she's one of the few women in the very early days of white settlement in Australia that we kind of know anything about. Most of the others are blanks. We don't know that much about Elizabeth MacArthur, but what we do know, which is that he, she kept the big sheep business going of her family while her husband was away, what we do know is that she must have been a remarkable woman to do that. And I was drawn to that story because I love stories that haven't haven't been properly told. I love the silenced stories and to try to get in there and imagine my way into them. And I thought, okay, she must have been an incredible woman. The only way for, for me to find out about her is to write a book about her. When you were going through the process, I mean, obviously there's you, you go on the journey of finding out more about somebody, but what was something that you found out about her, be a few things that you found out about her that really surprised you? Oh, that's a really good question. Look, the first surprise, and it's probably no real surprise to most people, is that, you know, John MacArthur, her husband, is always, you, was spoken of in my childhood as the father of the wool industry, the father of the wool industry when the wool industry was our biggest, you know, um, export industry. Uh, what I discovered, of course, is that he was actually not in Australia for most of the years that the Merino sheep was developed. If anybody on that particular property was the parent of the Australian wool industry, it was Elizabeth MacArthur, not him. I think we have a mother of the wool industry, not a father. The other thing, though, that was kind of more, more surprising was in the myths that I had grown up learning about the MacArthurs, they had been portrayed as gentry, if not actually aristocracy, definitely upper class people. So the first big surprise for me was that in fact they came from extremely humble circumstances. Elizabeth MacArthur was the daughter of a farmer in a very sm fairly small way in Devon, not a rich family, and they were sort of turned off the estate when her father died. John MacArthur's father was a draper in Portsmouth. So, you know, that is not high class and it's also not very wealthy. So what that told me is the, huh, 
the sort of Australian snobbery that we always want to find a duke in our family history. And even if somebody is just plain old Mrs. MacArthur, people tend to think of her as and often refer to her as Lady MacArthur. So that was a surprise. And it was also something I saw that I could, I thought, okay, I'm onto something here because there's a myth grown up here and the myth is false. And that's where a novelist can step in. There's a mantra or a philosophy around the book. It's the words, do not believe too quickly. Um, It's a phrase that's in the book, uh, in the material surrounding it, even on the dust cover, you use that phrase. Um, And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit, bit about where that phrase comes from and how it shaped your approach in bringing this story to life. Yeah, writing a book is such a strange, um, mysterious process. I remember one day I was sitting up in bed in my front room writing with the hot water bottle at my feet and a phrase came to me, please do not understand me too quickly. And I knew that it was from André Gide. Mm. I really don't know the context for Gide. But as I heard it, I thought, okay, this is a kind of mantra for my book. Not only do not understand too quickly, but do not believe too quickly. I don't quite know what André Gide meant by it, but what I take it to mean is don't accept the story, the stereotype, the myth, and don't make things too simple. Always look for the story that hasn't been told and always look for the nuance. I I think it really resonated with me too as an Indigenous reader because there's a saying that we have that the silences are more important than the words and it is really about meditating on on what what you don't see or or thinking deeply about what you are hearing but might not realise at first and um, it did really feel like that was sort of speaking to me. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how in this project you obviously in developing the story took snippets of things from real life. Um, I guess probably like a little bit of a bower bird collecting bits and pieces. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you wove those pieces together into a human story and where you make the decision that you can leave fact and go into fiction. Well, that last part is easy because with with Elizabeth MacArthur, as with so many of those people, facts are a bit thin on the ground. So I didn't actually leave any of the facts behind um, except one that I've acknowledged, which is that I combined two governors into one because they, for the purposes of the book, it would have felt very repetitious if I'd had two of them. Other than that, though, I stuck to whatever facts I could find And it is amazing what, for example, uh, records of birth and marriage and so on reveal. uh, Just, I mean, they are fact. There are not many facts, it seems to me, in the primary record. Uh, Parish records are pretty much a fact. So I didn't really have to depart from the facts. And what I found when I delved into the the facts, the primary documents about Elizabeth MacArthur, rather than the things that other people had said about her, was that a lot of the facts are led in a very interesting and contradictory direction. Um, Lots of examples about that, but one of the primary ones would be, you know, John MacArthur was, by all accounts, a really unpleasant piece of work, even when he was a young man. That's fairly evident from some letters. Um, and And he also had no money and no looks, and Elizabeth MacArthur had no money either. So the big question is, why did she marry him? In a Jane Austen novel, it would have been out of the question that these two moneyless people could have got married. And then you look at the date and you realise that she was four months pregnant when they got married. Ah, okay. Suddenly you have, well, you have a story, but you also have a whole set of questions. How did that come about? But it answers that otherwise puzzling thing. Why did why did a woman who seems to have been shrewd and, and fairly pleasant marry this absolutely ruthless bully of a man? 
I'll have to say you never question that in the book. You're so drawn into the moment and the circumstances around it. Um, I was wondering also too, just to get into some of the deeper aspects of the book itself and trying to do this without being too much of a spoiler because, of course, there are some great dramatic choices in the book that one doesn't want to give too much away, um, even though it's based on a real figure. And I guess one of the things that um, I'd love to talk to you about is uh, the role you give Lieutenant Dawes in this book. He's a very enigmatic figure and a very charismatic figure in this book. And hes it's not the first time he's been a muse for you. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what draws you to him and and, you know, I guess why he becomes a recurring theme in your writing. He's a very, um, he's a very s- sort of seminal person for me. When I was re- starting to research The Secret River, and that goes back to about year, the year 2000, I was reading everything and anything about early Sydney to try and, try and get past what I'd been taught, basically, try to get past the myths that I'd been taught in primary school and think out for myself what it might have really been like. And I came across some of the letters of, well, first of all, references to William Dawes and bits of his notebooks. He was one of the very few people in those early days who had more than a kind of museum interest in the Indigenous Sydney people. He was, because he was the local astronomer, he was out rather isolated from the settlement. And for that reason, I think the local people might have felt easier about visiting him, but also his character clearly attracted them because reading the notebooks in which he transcribed his attempts to learn the Gadigal language, you can see his personality emerging. And here is somebody unlike the others that he was surrounded by who treated, thought about the Indigenous people with respect and curiosity, a respect for the difference and a fascination with the difference rather than dismissing the difference as inferiority. So he stands out like a beacon in all those early accounts of the colony as being really the only man who chose a different path from the one that the majority were taking. The majority were taking the line that, you know, the British had uh, some God-given right to simply move in and take over the place. Uh, I don't think Dawes ever felt that. And, in fact, in his later life, he became um, an abolitionist and he worked very hard for slaves and ex-slaves. So he had a real commitment there, which was which was very different. So that was already very attractive. Um, and the notebooks also, something about his character does come through. You realise that he was quite a playful, self-mocking man who didn't stand on his own dignity uh, I'm not the only person to have found William Dawes, as you say, charismatic and charming. And it was another reference to Dawes where the roommate, a roommate of leaves really began because in uh, Elizabeth MacArthur and Dawes were in Sydney at the same time and Elizabeth was pretty bored so she asked for some lessons in astronomy from Dawes and he gave them to her. And, you know, she wrote, she's written quite a lot of letters. They're the main primary source, and most of them are incredibly boring. They're very dull, and they're very impersonal. You would not feel any sense of a personality there. You, you go looking in vain for a personal, a personal view there because letters were public things in those days, not particularly private. So these letters um, were very boring, and I read a lot of them. And then she says, okay, I went to Mr. Dawes for lessons, in astronomy, and she said, I found it too hard. I mistook my abilities and I blush at my error. Now, those five words, I blush at my error, they blazed off the page, at least for me as a novelist, because in the context of her other letters, they reveal all kinds of things about her. And I thought, ah, this is back in 2000 or 2001. There's a real story here. I want to write William Dawes' story. But then I'm going to get back to Elizabeth MacArthur's story and what happened after she blushed. Yes, well, there's a there's a cliffhanger for people if they want an inducement (laughs) to go and buy the book. I mean, and it strikes me just also listening to you um, how different the characters of John MacArthur and William Dawes are. It's almost like if you were if you really were starting from scratch with a fiction, you couldn't have two more opposing characters. 
That's right. That's a good point. In fact, as a novelist, you probably wouldn't dare set up such a such a strong contrast, but there it is. And of course, this book is very much playing with ideas of fiction and fact, because what I'm really interested in, beyond Elizabeth MacArthur, who is a fascinating character, but I have a, a bigger fish to fry with this book, which is to say um, every story that comes to the forefront about an event or a time obscures and erases all the other stories that might be told about that same event. And that seems to me a very dangerous thing because it leads to a very kind of mono, a mono story, just one story that has to be accepted as true, whereas in fact, as we know, truth, even in the present and very much about the past as well, is made up of dozens, hundreds of different stories, and they're all true in this in their different ways. I want to return to that theme a little later on because, as you say, it is a huge motif through this book and I think in, in other works you've done as well. It's obviously a, a an idea that you think deeply about. I mean, also the the interest in Dawes, I think, is one because he he gives a path forward that could have been very different. And I think you've explored this in your work. If we if we had have had a relationship between Aboriginal people and and um, other Australians that was much more like Dawes, interested, thought there was something to learn, it would be a different story. Um, I'm interested, you know, obviously that that those questions around the relationship between Indigenous people and Australians is something that you look at. But I think the other thematic that feels really strong to me through the book is, of course, about um, the choices before women and how we navigate those choices, maybe the lack of choices. And what we see you look at with the way you help us investigate Elizabeth MacArthur and her life is really how a smart woman navigates the world around her, particularly with, as you say, a fairly unpleasant husband. Um, and I think the way, although this is obviously set in a particular period, but I think the way in which she hides her intelligence as a strategy and has to really be smart about how she gets what she wants from the constraints around her I think for me really resonated in terms of some of the issues facing women today. And I was just wondering in in terms of looking at how Elizabeth MacArthur navigated that world, and as you pointed out, um, she was probably most likely to have, well, she was the one who was, had the most to do with the development of um, the sheep that her husband is now credited with. Did you see any connections from the sorts of things that were being drawn out in her life around the situation of women to contemporary connections with the challenges that we still face. Yes, look, I tend to write what is sadly called historical fiction. So the, a lot of my books are set in the past, and although I am interested in the past, uh, my main interest is in the present. So all my books of historical fiction are actually about today. And it is a very sad fact that what Elizabeth MacArthur had to do 200 years ago, and many women, that is be the power behind the throne, trying to manipulate a man into doing what she saw the right thing to do was, because she herself had no power. The tragedy is that that is not that uncommon in this, in this day as well. I mean, these days, we have come a long way. And we have, we have words like mansplaining for things that women have always, <laughs> there's always been this kind of Freemasonry of women who have a conversation below the conversation where they understand what they're saying, that, you know, the sisterhood of understanding. And unfortunately, we still have that because it is still an incredibly so sexist and misogynistic society. We in wealthy countries like Australia are very, very lucky to have a huge amount of independence and power as women, but we also can, as is vividly revealed recently, uh, intelligent, incredibly well-educated, privileged women can still feel helpless in the face of, for example, sexual harassment. Uh, the statistics about women putting themselves forward for leadership positions, women tend to say, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do it. 
the man will say, oh, yes, me, please. So there's still a whole kind of superstructure of ways in which women still have to do what I've shown Elizabeth MacArthur doing, which is getting quite cunning about um, manipulating her man because it was the only power she had. Mm, and I still think even just in that the the personal relationship sphere, I think, you know, um, women who found themselves in in relationships where there there you know there is uh, emotional abuse particularly would would find the strategies similar and it doesn't certainly doesn't read like a, a me too novel it's certainly not the case i guess what's more striking about it is that actually the reflection of what is you know what feels like such a truthful interrogation of of somebody's life at that time within those constraints can still feel like it has a resonance with how we live now. It sort of feels like it's a much more um, a poignant kind kind of an, um, connection to make between then and now. I have a nasty feeling that an awful lot of women will say, oh, wow, yes, I've been there. Mm. And that's, that's a source of sadness. But, you know, once you realise that, you know, as we used to say back in the 70s, the personal is political, it's not your own story, it's a story of a system, and it's a system that has to be repaired. So that's a hugely, uh, I found it a very empowering thing, that idea that, okay, my story is repeated a thousand times. I am not unique, and that's a good thing. Mm. Um, I wanted to then talk about uh, the elements of the book where you, I guess, interrogate the relationship between the colonists and Aboriginal people a little bit more and um, ask you to maybe explain how you research and draw together the story of the clans of both Sydney and Parramatta and particularly figures like Patagarang and Pemelwoy. Yeah, the, the great problem with all of that is that the only accounts of any of that that we have, unless there are some... Um, Indigenous traditional oral histories that have come down. The only accounts we have are made by, are written by the settlers, by the white people. And that means that, to me, that means they are automatically should be taken with a pinch of salt. So because I read uh, all the contemporary accounts, there are about half a dozen people who came with the first fleet who left diaries. Uh, Tench is the most interesting, but there are a couple of others. So you go through all that, um, and there there are all kinds of bits of evidence, but every one of them is written f from a set of assumptions, um, written from their own world. How could it be otherwise? So, for example, there's a there's a event in the book called the Battle of Parramatta, which is a well known historical event. It's a um, an event that happened at Parramatta when a group of um, warriors led by Pemelwy is supposed to have attacked the garrison of, of Parramatta, one of the most heavily fortified places in the country. And these clever warriors are supposed to have attacked in broad daylight this place. So not surprisingly, many of them were killed with muskets, whereas normally, of course, they knew that guerrilla warfare was incredibly effective. In fact, you didn't even have to have warfare. All you had to do was to burn the corn crops and the settlers would starve. So the fact that they did this incredibly uncharacteristic thing ought to be a signal to us to think, well, okay, should we believe this? Do not believe too quickly. So I, I read, for example, the one contemporary account of that, and I thought there are so many questions here. And the problem is, as far as I know, there are no other versions, no other contemporary versions. There is no way now to know what, for example, Pemelwy was intending on that day or even really what happened. So we, as Elizabeth MacArthur says, we may not be able to know exactly what happened, but what we should do is not believe too quickly the story, that the glib story that we're being told. Yes, I love how you actually kind of recreate that in the book where she's getting snippets of what she's heard, like with the gunshots, like literally what she's heard, what she sees or can't see, and then the bits that she has that does, I think it's a, it's a great kind of way to show how sketchy some of the accounts of those stories are. 
There's a moment towards the end of the book. It's a, a moment of reflection for Elizabeth when she looks back on her life, particularly this position that she's now in, um, much more um, successful than where she started out on life, but in life, but also sort of reflecting on what that means to the people whose country she's on, an insight that she's obviously gotten to have through her uh, relationship with Dawes and engagement with his ideas and perspective. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that because some of those conclusions are obviously, you know, very profound in terms of our contemporary conversations. And just, I guess, what how you decided what conclusions she would draw, what you felt it was important for her to say. One of the reasons the book took me 20 years and 34 drafts, which sounds crazy, but one of the reasons, one of the, in fact, the, probably the biggest difficulty was exactly that. Uh, the MacArthur's were the first people to dispossess uh, the people on whose land they settled out at Parramatta. So in that sense, they were like the people in the Secret River, uh, the, the first, you know, that first contact and the first dispossession. So I needed to come at it, and I felt that I had kind of told a version of that story in The Secret River, but I knew that there was more to that. Um, I had told the events, I suppose, in The Secret River and seen the hollowness of the victory of the white people and the grief and the shadow that lay over their lives ever after. So what happens next? Uh, what happens next is that a story develops about it, a myth, uh, usually a story by which it is okay to have done it. And, you know, white people for the last 200 years in Australia have come up with all sorts of stories about, well, it's all right. But I thought, okay, that's the way in which Elizabeth MacArthur can come at it. She can not pretend that it wasn't as bad as it was. I mean, she's in the position... She's in the position that any of us descendants of settlers is in, which is we think, well, we can't go back. There's nowhere for us to go back to, but we live on stolen land. So what do we do with that indigestible fact? So that's the puzzle that I personally uh, live with, you know, at, at some level. And it was what I had to give to Elizabeth MacArthur and a bit like the Battle of Parramatta, I have no answer to that, but I gave my thinking to her, which is to say, I'm prepared to acknowledge what I've what I've done and what my my lot have done. I'm prepared to acknowledge it and to grieve for it. And as she says, that doesn't really help anything. That doesn't make any difference to anything. But perhaps it's the first thing that you have to do, the thing that opens the door then to something else happening. So it, I don't, you know, once I had arrived at that point for her, I thought, well, why has it taken me 20 years? But these things are very difficult. They're not, they're not, not simple in any way and they're inconclusive. So that's where, she, that's where she's left, sitting by the side of a river that she has come to love, the Parramatta River, in her room made of leaves, which she has come to love, thinking, well, I call this my room made of leaves, but actually I have to accept that it's not mine and work from there. Mm, there's another reflection too in, in you know, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a deep thoughtful reflection that's, that's fleshed out through in that, that part of the book. Uh, but it is a thematic you return to where she says that, um, you know, perhaps one of the worst things we've done is, is uh, sort of put our story over their story. That seems to be another the time you return to that theme. That's right. And actually when we were talking the other day, you pointed out something that I must have known unconsciously, but it took you to point it out for me to realise it, which is that the Secret River ends with uh, a, a settler building his house literally on top of uh, an Indigenous ceremonial rock engraving literally erasing that story with his own. So uh, isn't it odd? I found the metaphor 20 years ago and it's taken me 20 years to kind of work through the metaphor to the literalisation of that, to say, okay, 
we tell a story, for example, about Elizabeth MacArthur or about the Battle of Parramatta, and that story then becomes kind of set in stone and it just silences every other story. Mm-hmm. And that's and the, this is the point in history where I think we are undoing that. I think this is a moment when we're actually aware of that. The Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, all these powerful movements to say there are other voices here, other other rights, and they must be listened to. Uh, it's it, it's a very tumultuous moment, but it's a very positive one because for the first time, some of those old, oh, and the tearing down of the statues, some of those old uh, stereotypes and truths are being questioned. Mm. That that metaphor from the end of Secret River that we discussed the other day is, is one of my favourites. I refer to it a lot because I feel like it's such a beautiful symbolism of that very powerful idea. So um, <laughs> I hope you keep coming back to it and coming back to it. But I want to pick up this idea about the moment that we're at in relation to this, because obviously false stories is a, a strong theme in the book, both about, I guess, what we say about ourselves, how we, how we craft our person, how somebody like John MacArthur crafts his image. Um, but it also says a lot about how we craft our broader national narratives. And I was wondering if you could talk about how the, you see those themes in the book resonating um, more broadly with the concept of truth-telling that we're talking about now in Australia. You mentioned Me Too, you mentioned the Black Lives Matter, but truth-telling was a an aspect of the Uluru statement, it's it's really been actually a part of the um, you know the Aboriginal agenda for reconciliation much longer than that. Um, this idea of coming to terms with our past. I wonder what your reflections are on on how um, th- this sort of work and this sort of story um, can 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 add to those conversations. It's like hammering at a door, isn't it, for years and years and years and and nothing happens. You hammer and hammer and they say, oh, yes, of course we'll let you in, but that door never quite gets opened. So, you know, the Uluru Statement, the fact that that's been sidelined um, or, or not simply accepted is, is, you know, that door stayed closed. Um, I think one of the things about fiction is that uh, one of the reasons I write fiction is certainly not to entertain. I think there are other people probably do the entertainment thing better. But I do, the, the thing that keeps me at the desk, you know, through a book, which is year, many years of writing, is a feeling that there's something there that matters. And what matters is to get under people's radars, to crack open that that shell of what they that set of beliefs that everybody has about the world. And that encompasses, as you say, your self-image, but also your kind of political feelings, uh, your sense of uh, what your nation means, all those kinds of things. To crack that open and kind of come around the back, instead of hammering at the front door, sneak around the back with a bit of fiction. Hopefully it is entertaining and it's engaging at an emotional level so that people, it was guard is down, so that something can be let in, which all the argument in the world, all the rational thinking in the world won't make any difference. But that little emotional connection with a character who is different from yourself and that the the power of the fiction carries you along with that person so that you empathise with them, uh, that that can actually make... uh, push things forward in some way, open some kind of new thinking. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that because I often find with your books that I, I it's almost like how I approach a movie when, I'm, when I've started filmmaking. I read it the first time just for the story and then start to think about the themes. And I, I think in some ways that's, that's your great gift, that it's, you don't feel when you're reading it that the themes are uh, boldly on the page they're more subtly on the page and it really is it's story it's emotion it's about how a, a you know a woman goes through life making choices and um I almost feel like the the great gift of the story is that you you get swept up with the the people and the personalities 
be, and then and then you, when you're thinking about that later, the themes hit you rather than the other way around. So um, it's interesting to hear you say how um, how central those themes are because they're really woven underneath what's there. It makes me um, wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, obviously when you write a book and it goes out in the world and people read it, what do you hope a reader will take away from a book, particularly this one? This well, it's a weird moment. I mean, this book is now just about to go out into the world. There have been a few comment, comment, few things in the commentariat about it already. Uh, there is a moment when you have to let go and that's, that's um, you write a book, you know, you write a book with an intention or at least with an exploration towards something that you know matters for all those years and you, you know, you do your best with it. Um and one thing I wanted to say when you were talking is that one of the things fiction can do is to work like a good teacher from what the person already knows to what they don't know. So one of the things about fiction is that if you make a character that people can think, oh, yes, I recognise myself in that character, you can then hopefully take the reader with you on a journey so that the, the reader moves almost imperceptibly from where they are familiar with to somewhere they're not familiar with, and that's a terrific experience of kind of opening up. Um, so the thing about letting go of a book, it's really difficult because, you know, you you have shaped the book just the way you want. But what you have to accept is that when a book goes out into the world, it's not it's no longer a book. It's as many books as it has readers because every reader reads it through the filter of everything that's ever happened to them, the person they are all the experiences they've ever had. It's a different book. The, the book that you read is not quite the book that I wrote. And for a, reader, for a writer, you, you have to accept that. In fact, you have to glorify it. You have to think, okay, that is fantastic, like letting your children go, I suppose, with the obvious analogy. Uh, let them go out into the world, and I don't know what it's, what's going to happen there, but... Um, I've created something that's got wings that can go out. So what I'd like people to take from this is, first of all, a sense that uh, those people of the past, particularly the women of the past, uh, shouldn't be summarised as these shallow, one-dimensional people that they so often are. We shouldn't be too sure that they were what they appeared to be. We should use our own human wisdom in thinking, well, Actually, is that likely? Would I have been like that if I was in that situation? And then to take that same idea to much bigger ones, political ones and philosophical ones, and, well, I can't do it, I can't say it any more, any more clearly than do not believe too quickly. Always ask of anything that is told you, political or commercial or philosophical, who is telling this story and what's in it for them? How much should I believe? Let me think it through for myself and let me always recognise that behind every story there has to be another one and another one behind that, and they all have elements of truth. They should all be accepted. It's a wonderful thing to keep meditating on. And um, this one has wings. It's landed here, and I love that we both have books behind us. We didn't plan <laughs> that. It's not like we rang and said, what were you wearing? Um, we didn't coordinate it. And what you can't see is my Kate Grenville section is actually over there beside my Jane Austen Bronte sisters section, so I'll be oh, putting this right. I'm in good company. My other, my other books. Um but I guess I wanted to just ask you a couple more questions moving on from the book. And um, I guess um, the first is with, it's such a strange time. It must be very strange for you having gone through the process of having books come out, book <laughs> festivals, book <laughs> tours, signings, to be doing this all in a COVID world. I was wondering if you could tell us what that's feeling like. Yes, well, uh, it's been a bit of a learning experience for me because I always used to think, well, you know, you have to get out on the on the hustings and, and go to the festivals and, you know, do all those things. And I always used to tell myself, I enjoy meeting, <clears throat> pardon me, I enjoy meeting readers, but, you know, really all that is not my, I'm really a very, very unsociable person. All I want to do is get back at home under my stone and start writing again. And that's true to some extent, but I have had to realise that I am really missing all that socialising, you know, there's a gregarious streak to me, which I think I hadn't quite recognised, and I'm really missing getting out there and 
meeting readers and even ha even having somebody stand up the back and say, you know, I didn't like your book because X, Y, and Z. It's fabulous. The blood starts pumping. <laughs> Yes, I think we've all learned a little bit of something about ourselves during social isolation that we didn't know before. Was that the main thing you learned about yourself, that you're actually more outgoing or were there other things in terms of how, um, you know, you, you've you've um, found um, life now that you're sort of stuck at home in social isolation? Yeah, look, I suppose the flip side of that is that I've, I have always been fairly sociable. So because I live alone and I work alone, uh, I, I make a point of, you know, meeting people for coffee and so on a lot. And one of the things that's happened in isolation is that I've realised that less is more. So it's interesting who you want to go on talking to and who you just, you know, the weeks go by and you don't actually contact them. That's that's quite interesting. It's like there's a, in these circumstances, there's a kind of limit to what you can do. And so you've got to do the ones that are really, uh, yeah, you, you kind of know who really matters to you. So, you know, uh, and maybe there are only half a dozen of them instead of a couple of dozen. And family, of course, is suddenly extremely important. My children, obviously, my stepchildren, my brother. So suddenly, all that becomes very precious. And of course, at my age, uh, the COVID thing. Um, I mean, we're always conscious that death is around the corner, but of course, we kind of pretend, oh, not yet, not yet. COVID has made that very real, and you think, okay, I've probably got, if I'm lucky, a certain number of more years. Um, what should I do with them? What 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 is it all about? What is the meaning of life? <laughs> I, I get that actually <laughs> for um, uh, many of us Aboriginal people, um, you know, obviously the vulnerable age is 70, then it's 60 if you have an underlying issue, health issue, and then at 50 if you're Indigenous, then you're vulnerable. So I've had a few instances where we're being just past the big five zero. <laughs> I'm classed as vulnerable like a 70-year-old. So it's been, first of all, a sobering reminder of the need to close the health gap. But secondly, I, I think like you, I keep thinking, well, you know, how am I going to make the most of it, which is a great segue to my last question, which is, of course, what everyone will want to know, which is what's next? Ah, well, I, I always have a couple of books waiting at the bus stop because what I dread is a gap. I have I have this feeling that I might never start, never write again if I ever stop. So I've actually got a couple of ideas overlapping. One is a book about my grandmother. I seem to be going through my entire family. My grandmother was born in 1880, so she just managed to benefit from compulsory, free, secular public education. And that seems to me a revolution among the vast bulk of the population who otherwise didn't even get to learn to read and write. A huge revolution that we don't kind of quite recognise. Now, my grandmother was in fact a frustrated, unpleasant, uh, waspish old woman. I do remember her as a very unpleasant, very un uncuddly grandma. But she opened the door for my mother's generation to get properly educated and properly trained. My mother was a pharmacist. So I think that's a kind of the lost generation really was women of those 1880s. Not a coincidence that that was the generation of suffragettes and so on. Uh, they, they fought for us and they're kind of a bit the forgotten generation, particularly ones like my grandmother who was, you know, working class, rural uh, family up in Tamworth. So we'll see. I'm not sure where that's going to go, but um, I've got a, yeah, she's more than a gleam in my eye. Right. And any other hints, any other uh, personalities of the um, early colony that have, are in your sights? Not so much the early, well, actually, well, there are dozens of those, aren't there? Yes. But, what contention, um, for example? Exactly. What contention <laughs> might be the next one? To, I, I might have, I might have had enough fun with what contention. He comes across in his own book as such a charmer. Mm. But when you flip the coin a little bit and think about charming men that you have known, we've all known men like Tench who are essentially flirts and teasers. Mm and not to be taken seriously, I might have, I might have done my dash with Tench. Um, but um, 
Look, I'm also very interested. It's always the stories that haven't been told, the silenced ones. And uh, someone was telling me a while ago about an aunt of theirs who was unmarried, again, the generation born in the 1880s, unmarried, teased for her whole life about the fact that she wasn't married. Uh, she ran a girls' school, very successful. Uh, one night a man tried to get in and they all, all the girls rushed down and said, there's a man, there's a man. She, she, she issued hockey sticks all round and they rushed out into the <laughs> yard to beat this guy up. You think about that woman and you think, well, who knows, but she may well have had a female companion and they had to live their entire lives, you know, in a hidden, in a hidden way. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm able to tell that story, but it's a story that should be told. Well, you've left us with plenty to mull over, and congratulations again on a wonderful book. It's a, it was a, it's a fabulous read, but I also think it's such a great conversation starter and a real, real book for now for a lot of the. I think it's going to resonate with a lot of issues. Um, so I want to just uh, thank the Wheeler Centre for. Um, facilitating this today and the events being co-presented uh, with the uh, Macedon Rangers Shire Council. So a big shout out to them too. But the biggest shout out, um, Kate, is to you. So thanks for being such a, such a prolific writer, such a wonderful writer, so engaging and so generous with your time. Oh, thank you. It has been such fun to talk to you as always. Thanks, Larissa. <music> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.